ambientalismo de livre mercado, como o capitalismo a, 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 protege o meio ambiente. E a gente vai contar com a participação do professor Walter Bloch, que é PHD em Economia pela Columbia University e professor titular da Loyola University em Nova Orleans. Além de ser acadêmico sênior, sênior do Business Institute, com a palavra para o professor Bloch. Usually when people introduce me, I say thanks for the kind introduction, but I don't know what kind of introduction it was. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me. I hope everyone speaks English because my knowledge of Portuguese, I know obligado and banho. <laughs> banho is a very important word, but that's all I know, so it has to be in English, so I hope people understand. I want to thank, before I start, two groups. Uh, one is... Uh, Estudantes pela Liberdade, uh, raise your hand if you're involved in that. If people in the audience are interested, please see these people. The other group uh, that invited me to Sao Paulo for a, a weekend uh, conference that just took place is um, Mises Institute Brazil. Raise your hand if you're involved in that group. If people are interested, please see these people. My topic uh, today is free enterprise and the environment. And I understand a lot of people will see these two as almost opposites, that if you favor free enterprise, you must oppose uh, environment. And my view is the opposite, that free enterprise not only will help the environment, but is the best way to help the environment, maybe even the only way to help the environment. But I know that a lot of people have a different view. So I ask you to Listen, be open-minded. We can end up disagreeing or agreeing or agreeing partially. But if you are opposed and don't listen, then we won't have a communication. And I'm hoping to have a good communication. My view is a libertarian view. Libertarianism is the view that, uh, based on private property rights and non-invasion, non-aggression. The essence of libertarianism is you must keep your hands to yourself, don't grab other people or their property without their permission. That's a very short nutshell view of what libertarianism is. Is it left or right? Well, I don't know the political context in Brazil, but in the US, it's neither left nor right. The left is a little bit better on personal liberties from a libertarian point of view. They, some of them favor legalized prostitution, legalized pornography, legalized drugs, which doesn't mean you favor these things, it just means you want to legalize them. So libertarians agree a little bit with the left on personal liberties, and you can marry anyone you want. Ron Paul, who is now running for president, his view on homosexual marriage is it's none of the business of the state. Whatever individuals want is fine. On economics, the right is a little bit better, not much better. I mean, Mitt Romney is horrible on, on economics, but he's maybe a little bit better from, than Obama, at least from the libertarian point of view of embracing laissez-faire capitalism. On foreign policy, they're both horrible. A lot of people in South America, they hear free enterprise and they think US, and they hear US and they think imperialism. And in a sense, they're right. Ron Paul says that the US has, what is it, 800 military bases in 130 different countries? And they dare to call this defense? No, this is offense. So don't confuse this imperialistic view with my view, even though we use some of the same words. The libertarian view is very much against imperialism. Okay, that's a, a very brief introduction to where I'm coming from. Now what I'm going to do is to try to make the case that my particular view, it's not original with me, but I represent this view, will help the environment. And I'm going to go over maybe six or eight different environmental issues and try to illustrate in each case how this philosophy can address the environment. And the issues I've chosen are air pollution, the choice between paper bags and plastic bags, uh, overpopulation, forests, running out of resources, 
species extinction, global warming, and environmental racism. Now, uh, these aren't all the issues, uh, and I can't spend much time on each because I want to cover the waterfront. But if there are any that I've left out that you think are important, certainly during the question and discussion period, we can discuss them. Okay, so let me start with air pollution. Now, I don't know what your background is, but the way the neoclassical economists, or the way most economists deal with pollution is with supply and demand. Is everyone familiar with supply and demand? Raise your hand if you know what supply and demand is. Raise your hand if you don't. Okay, everybody knows. So here is uh, quantity, and here is price, and here is supply, and there is demand. And we know that in equilibrium, not only will prices tend toward this price, but quantities will tend toward that quantity in equilibrium. So if the price is higher, it'll go to equilibrium. If the price is lower, it'll go up to equilibrium. If the quantity is less, it'll go moving toward equilibrium. And if the quantity is higher, it'll move backwards toward equilibrium. And this is OK for ordinary goods, like a wristwatch or a, a tie. How do they treat pollution? The way they treat pollution is they say, this is an external diseconomy, or uh, a negative externality. What they say is that um, this is based on costs. And let's say we're producing this uh, credenza here. This is the business we're in. We're producing this. And what goes into the supply? What kind of costs? Well, labor. We have to pay the workers. We have to buy the wood. We have to get a factory. Costs like that. But what they say is that there are external costs that the owner of the factory that makes these credenzas doesn't take into account. And what are these costs? These costs are smoke pollution. We have a smokestack, and out of the smokestack comes dirt, dust particles. And it goes into people's lungs, and it goes onto their clothes. And the owner of the factory doesn't have to pay. Uh, for the people who came in late, I've converted everyone else to free market environmentalism. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just starting. But I'm not going to repeat what I said. Uh, so here is supply and demand. And what they say is that when we take into account all the costs, not just the private costs, these are the private costs. But if we take into account all the costs, then the costs will be higher. If we add the private costs and the social costs, and the social costs are the costs to other people, that uh, they can't charge us for it. See, the, the owner of the labor, the owner of the wood, the owner of the factory, they can charge us. But the people who are victimized by us can't charge us, so we ignore them. So if we take that into account, then we get a higher supply curve, and the price of these things should be higher to reflect the full cost, and we should produce less of them. That's what they say. And in order to do this, there are various ways, like the carbon tax would be an example, or tax oil, because oil goes into cars and it comes out as fumes, uh, also tax things like this. The way the libertarian sees it is a little bit different. The way we see this issue is that if you put your garbage into other people's property and into their lungs, you're invading them. You're violating the libertarian axiom of non-aggression. You're violating property rights, private property rights. It makes them, look, suppose I take my garbage orange peels, eggshells, coffee grounds, uh, pork bones, and I dump them on your lawn. What will happen? I'll go to jail because I'm invading. I'm trespassing. But suppose I burn this all up into very fine particles, and now I do the same thing. All of a sudden, it's an externality? No. 
It's not an externality, it's still pollution. It should still be stopped. But the government doesn't stop. Now, I don't know the situation, again, in Brazil, I apologize, but in the US, in the 1830s, <clears throat> there were a bunch of environmental cases they were called nuisance cases in those days, but we now see them as really environmental cases. And what happened was some little old lady would hang up her, uh, there were no dryers then, she'd hang up her clothes on a clothesline, and she'd hang it up, it would be clean and wet. She'd come back two hours later, it would be dry and dirty. Why dirty? Because the factory over there polluted her laundry. Or there'd be a farmer and the farmer would have haystacks. And the, the train <clears throat> would come along with sparks 150 feet into the air and would set, a, uh, set on fire his haystacks. And they went to court. And in the 1830s, the courts were sympathetic to this sort of environmental plaintiff. Not always. The plaintiff didn't always win. You had to prove that the, the dust particles came from that factory or that the sparks came from that railroad. But if you could prove this, and it wasn't too hard, you could get damages and an injunction. What's damages? Money. They have to pay you for the haystacks or they have to pay you for the dirty laundry. An injunction means the court says, stop. Don't do it anymore. If you do it more, we'll put you in jail. And this is sort of a libertarian ideal. Libertarian ideal doesn't mean no pollution. I mean, when we breathe out, we breathe out carbon dioxide. We don't want to have zero pollution, otherwise we would die because we could only breathe in, we couldn't breathe out. Uh, so there's a continuum problem, and in law there's a thing called de minimis. The law doesn't take into account trifles like breathing out. But it certainly takes into account a big smokestack with uh, dirt, dirt particles all over the place. And this had several good effects. One good effect was the, the railroad would engage in smoke prevention devices. Because rather than get the farmer on their case, they would uh, try to keep the sparks close to the railroad. And the uh, factory would put something in its chimney a mesh uh, to keep the, the particles there and not let them out onto other people's property. Did this work perfectly? No, there's still a little spark, there's still a little bit, but uh, in the reality, you can't have perfection. We don't live in the Garden of Eden, but it worked pretty well. And also you had a thing called environmental forensics. Now, we all know what forensics is. That's, you study blood and semen and uh, stuff under your fingernails because we have a law against rape and murder. And if you want to know who raped and murdered, you have to know what the blood type is and uh, the semen and um, hair follicles, whatever. So now they had environmental forensics, namely they had to figure out where did this dust come from? From here, from there, where? So these things were pretty good, and we had a pretty good situation. Then comes the 1890s. We have the progressive period, and the US wants to become an imperialist country. Who was the biggest imperialist country in the 1890s? Great Britain. They were the imperialists. They were the bad guys. And the US, we decided we have to be beat Britain. Well, when you want to beat Britain and some stupid farmer comes along and says, uh, that railroad is ruining my property, you say, the hell with your private property rights. Your selfish, stinking, lousy private property rights. There's something more important than private property rights, and that's the public good. And what does the public good consist of? Manufacturing. Uh, they gave... Uh, a little sop, a little side benefit to the little old lady who complained about the factory. They had minimum smokestack height regulations. 
So previously the smokestack was 20 feet, and now the smokestack is 100 feet. When it's 20 feet, it only pollutes the local area. When it's 100 feet, it pollutes everywhere. So it, instead of putting the problem under the rug, they're putting the problem into the clouds. Now, suppose you were a green businessman. You were uh, an environmentalist businessman. You didn't want to pollute. Which would you use? Clean burning anthracite coal, which is a little more expensive, or dirty burning sulfur coal? Well, if you're a green businessman, you would use more expensive anthracite coal because it doesn't pollute other people, or very little. But, and in the 1830s, everyone had to do that. Because if you didn't, you'd get damages and an injunction. But in the 1890s, if you were stupid enough to use clean burning coal, you would go broke. Because your competitors were using dirty burning cheaper coal and they didn't have to pay for it. Adam Smith says that the invisible hand leads to good effects. He was right. But only when you have property rights. If you don't have private property rights, if you allow people to invade other people's property, then the invisible hand doesn't work. Because now it doesn't pay to use the cheap, uh, uh, the expensive clean burning anthracite coal, it pays to use the dirty burning to create the problem. So the solution is to go back to the 1830s. Now people say, but it's impossible, you can't sue individual cars. I mean, there are tens of thousands of cars, motorcycles too, around here, I've noticed. You can't, you can't sue this guy and he sued that guy, it just wouldn't work. One of my recent books is Why We Should Privatize the Highways, and I could give a whole hour lecture on why we should do that and how it would work. But all, and I have a book on that, and it's really for free, uh, on the email, uh, the web, whatever. So if you're interested, look up Walter Block, Privatizing Highways, and you'll see the case for that. So I can't go into that now because I want to stick to environmentalism. But the point is, if we had private-owned highways, you wouldn't have to sue each individual motorcycle and each individual car. You could sue the highway owner for running a charnel house of pollution. And then the, the highway owner would charge much more for a dirty burning car than for a clean burning car. Okay, now as I said, I'm gonna go over about six or eight issues. I can't spend a half hour on each, so this is all I can say about it, um, air pollution. Now let me now talk about another problem, a problem that environmentalists are very concerned about, and that is paper bags versus plastic bags. And what the environmentalists say, that is the left-wing environmentalists, they say that plastic bags are horrible. Plastic bags will pollute. Plastic bags are a poison. Plastic bags are a devil's workshop. Whereas paper bags are okay. Paper bags, if you put them in the ground, they break up, they create more earth. Paper bags are good. And I want to show how the free enterprise system, if this is true, and I'm an economist, I don't, I'm not a chemist, so I don't know if this is true. You know, there's this joke, uh, there were three people marooned on an island, they had cans of food, and no can opener. And the physicist says, drop the can from here and you'll open the can, you could eat. The chemist says, no, 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 heat it up, it'll open up, and we can have warm food. And they turn to the economist and they say, how can you help us? And he says, assume a can opener. <laughs> Well, we have to assume things because we're not chemists. I don't know if this is true, but assume it's true. Assume that everything every left-wing environmentalist ever said about plastic is true, and also about paper. Now, how does the free market system work to help? Where did I put my pen? Ah, here it is. Okay, so here is plastic, and here is paper, and you go to the supermarket checkout counter, and you buy one of these things, 
Now, ordinarily, I don't know how it is in Brazil, but in the U.S., they give it away for free. But let's assume that they charge you for it. I mean, they give away electricity, they give away clean aisles, they give away other things for free. When you buy a salad, they give you a little plastic fork. But let's suppose they charge you. And let's suppose that each one of them cost one penny. What incentive would you have to be environmentally sound, environmentally correct, environmentally helpful? There are only two motivations. One is self-interest, and the other is benevolence. Well, self-interest isn't going to help you here because it costs the same. So the free market isn't working. But we forgot something. Not only do you have to buy the paper bag, but you have to dispose of it also. Right? I mean, you just can't buy paper or plastic. You have to get rid of it. Otherwise, your house will be full of paper and plastic. Now, in the U.S., what they've done is they've socialized garbage uh, storage or uh, garbage dumps. So you pay a certain tax, and uh, you pay the same tax whether you have paper or plastic. And then what they do is they pass laws compelling you to buy the paper and not the plastic. And the market isn't working. But the reason the market isn't working is because the market is not allowed to work because they've nationalized or socialized or municipalized the garbage dumps. Imagine if we had private garbage dumps. Imagine you're all a private garbage dump owner. People come to you and they put garbage in your area. You dig a hole and you put garbage in there and then you fill it up. And let's suppose that the true costs of disposing of a plastic bag, since it's so horrible, is $5, whereas the true cost of disposing of a paper bag is only a penny. OK, now you're a bunch of capitalist pigs on gunk. You want to maximize profits. How much are you going to charge if somebody puts a plastic bag in your dump? Remember, when the, plastic, when the dump is filled, it could be a farm, or it could be a housing, uh, a hotel, manufacturing. But only if it's paper. Because if it's plastic, it'll be poisonous. And you can't have a good farm or ask people to put their houses on a poisonous area. OK, so here, I have a plastic bag. How much are you going to charge me? You're a capitalist pig. Two dollars. Two dollars. No. You'll only make $3 profit. The right answer is minus infinity. <laughs> I'll have to, or an infinity. I'll have to pay you an infinite amount of money. But if you charge an infinite, somebody else will charge a little less. Right? Suppose you charge $15. Now you'll make $10 profit. But some other capitalist pig owner of a dump site will, if you're charging $15, what will you charge? $14.99. $14.98, $14.97, it keep going down to $5, at which point you make no profit. And in equilibrium, you don't make profits. So if we had price, and also for a paper bag, we, if the true costs are only a penny, then that's what the price will be in equilibrium. So now we can see how the market works. Because now the total costs, the sum of these costs, is 501 and two cents. See, when you're at the supermarket checkout counter without thinking of disposaling, dis disposaling, disposing, only benevolence will help you. But now, if you realize the full costs, 501 versus two cents, you're going to say, I'll take the paper. So you see how the market helps. If the market is allowed to operate, through private garbage dumps. If the market isn't allowed to operate, well then of course the market can't operate. Excuse me, I have to take a drug. Does this mean that there'll be no plastic bags used? No. It only means that if a, the plastic bags that are used 
will have to be worth more than 501. I just had a hip operation. I have a titanium hip. I was in the hospital and they had a plastic bag dripping stuff into me because I couldn't eat. Right? Plastic bags in hospitals. Those are worth more than 501. Those would be used. But right now we promiscuously use plastic bags because there's no price system that works to help us. The price system is supposed to indicate what's environmentally costly and what's not. And as we see, if it's 501 versus 2 cents, people will be led by an invisible hand to eschew, to ignore the plastic, unless it's worth a lot of money in a hospital. They'll say, I'll take a paper bag. So we see how the market helps. Okay, the next issue, overpopulation. People say we have too many people, we have seven billion people. Well, I don't, I, I was gonna say, I don't know about you, but in the US, the place is empty. We have 300 million people, and uh, just the continental US, forgetting about Alaska and Hawaii, you go up in a plane at night, and west of the Mississippi, there's nobody there. Maybe Denver. El Paso, nobody there. Even east of the Mississippi, it's empty. And I know in Brazil, the place is empty too. Sao Paulo, Rio, uh, a few other cities, but the place is empty. There's no overpopulation problem. Uh, Thomas Sowell, S-O-W-E-L-L, -L, one of my favorite economists, offers the following scenario. He says, suppose you take all seven billion people and you put them into one place in the form of a middle class US housing. Middle class US housing, the house is about 2,500 square feet. You have a front yard and a backyard. And that's it. No roads, no stores, no farms, nothing. But you take 7 billion people and you put them all in this area. What size area would hold all 7 billion? Texas. Little, I mean, Texas is a big state compared to the other states, but compared to the whole world, Texas is a little thing. Yet all the people could fit there. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how empty the universe is. Now, when I was a kid, and some of the older people here will bear me out on this, although I don't see anyone as old as me. I don't know what happened. Ah, you're, no, you're a young girl. <laughs> Anyone under 70 is a young girl. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, the thing we would do is to try to stuff people into telephone booths. Now, you don't even know what a telephone booth is. A telephone booth is about this high and this wide and this deep. And you try to get people into the telephone booth. Nowadays, what they have, the young people have is crowd surfing. Everyone gets in a crowd and you put one person above you and then you move him with your hands. Weird. Our way was better. <laughs> Do you know what size telephone booth you need to fit in all 7 billion people? One mile cube. Everyone, I'm 5'8", maybe average for my generation, and I'm, I don't know, uh, two feet wide and one feet deep, and I stand there, and we pile everybody in the, in the whole world, 7 billion people, into the telephone booth, one mile cube. Now it's going to get smelly in a minute. <laughs> it's not going to be comfortable, but it gives you an idea of how few people we have. Let me give you one more um, argument. I was once debating somebody on this question, and I said, my opponent is going to come up here and tell you that there are too many people. He has it within his power to reduce the size of the population by one. <laughs> Suicide. But he hasn't done it. Look, he's standing there smiling. And he's going to come here and say that there are too many people. He is committing a performative contradiction. Namely, what he's saying contradicts his existence. If he really seriously thought this, he'd kill himself. He hasn't killed himself. So even he doesn't take this nonsensical idea seriously. So why should we? And it was a very hostile audience, so I got booed. 
They thought I was trying to get him to commit suicide. I wasn't trying to get him to commit suicide. Yeah? Uh, so that's another point. Uh, he can ask for us to only have less children. Like you say, you, can't, you don't have to suicide, but you have to... He could have done that, but that's a different point. What I'm trying to say is I'm, I'm using a logical argument. I'm saying that if, you, if in order to articulate an argument, you have to commit a contradiction, there's a little bit of a problem with the argument. Okay, I'm moving along because I want to cover the waterfront. I can't spend a lot of time on every issue. The next issue is forests. What should be the optimal allocation between forests and other uses of land for farms or houses or golf courses? Well, in the marketplace, we have a system that allocates resources, say, between pens and wristwatches. Is there now a misallocation between pens and wristwatches? In Russia, in the Soviet Union, they would have uh, a ton of toilet paper and no chicken, or a ton of chicken and no toilet paper. Here, if we have too many pens and not enough wristwatches, the profit in pens will fall, because there are too many of them. There are too few wristwatches, the profit in wristwatches will rise until you get some sort of equilibration. And that's true for any two goods, or all goods, in the market. Well, I say it's the same thing with forests versus farms. If we have too many forests, the owners of forests, and they should all be privatized, the government should have very little role in anything, if anything at all. And if there are too many forests, the price of forests will fall. If not enough, the price of forests will rise, and we'll get more forests. And we'll... <coughs> and we'll have an equilibrium. See, the market takes care of this. We don't appreciate the free enterprise system. This is why when you go to the store, there are sweaters. When you go to the store, there's um, carrots. Because if there weren't carrots, the profits in carrots would rise and they'd be carrots. We don't appreciate that, but it's, that's the way the market works. That's why we don't have long, long lines of people waiting for stuff. It doesn't exist. Because if it doesn't exist, the profits go up and then people have an incentive to produce more of it to make profits. That's why the system works reasonably well. Well, I'm saying it should also work reasonably well for forests. If the, the left-wing environmentalists feel that we're running out of forests, that we're cutting down too many trees, if so, if it was all privately owned, well, then people would convert farms into forests, or vice versa. There was this movie, um, Medicine Man, with Sean Connery. Anyone see that movie? He was in the Brazilian rainforest, and he discovered a new drug that would cure MS or cancer, something, something very important. And uh, he was just making experiments on it, and over there, there were these um, machines cutting down all the trees. If somebody owned a forest where there was a cure for cancer in there, they would protect those trees, because you can make a lot of money curing cancer or MS or whatever the disease was. The Brazilian situation is, years ago, and you people know more about this than I, but my understanding from it is that they subsidized the cutting down of the rainforests. There was a, a competition between Argentina and Brazil as to who could have better cattle. And the Argentinians were winning the cattle fight, or the cattle competition. And the Brazilian government wanted Brazil to have more and better cattle. So what they did is they subsidized the cutting down of the rainforests. And every left-wing environmentalist in Europe and North America says, this shows capitalism is no good. Well, just as in the case that the plastic and the paper didn't work, unless you had private ownership of garbage dumps, it's not going to work if the Brazilian government owns the rainforest and subsidizes and lowers taxes and puts in roads there to make it more used up. So 
the answer to the problem is privatize it. My motto is, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. And since everything either moves or doesn't move, you privatize everything. And then the market, the magic of the market can work to help the environment. Okay, the next issue is we're going to run out of resources. We're going to run out of oil, peak oil, we're going to run out of this, we're going to run out of that. We never run out of anything. Why not? We're not sinking in space. Sorry? We are not sinking in space. We're not sending any, well, very little bit we send in space. The rest of it stays here. But the point is, let's suppose we start running out of oil. What happens to the price of oil? Higher or lower? Higher. We run out of stuff, the price goes up. And if the price goes up, we have two salutary effects. One, we use less of it. And the other, we look for more. We dig deeper, only not a, a mile, two miles deep. Or we look for substitutes, nuclear, whatever. Instead, what the government does, it tries to subsidize uh, wind power, and sun power and water power and this kind of power which costs triple what oil and gas and coal cost. This is not the way to run a railroad. This is not sensible. We don't have to fear running out of anything because the market will come to the rescue again. And you have to appreciate the market and you have to learn a little economics. And a lot of the left-wing environmentalists don't know this. So there really is no fear. My greatest uh, love is when you have those big windmills and they kill birds. And the environments love the windmills <laughs> and they love birds. <laughs> and now you have a little contradiction. See, in the market, what you would have is that people would own birds and they would own the, the windmill and then we could decide whether the uh, birds are more valuable than the wind or, or not. But we don't have prices. If you don't have prices, as Ludwig von Mises says with regard to socialism, you can't have rational planning. The only way to know whether to make rowboats out of wood or plastic or metal is to know what the prices of wood or plastic or metal are. And if the price of wood rises, well, then you make uh, fewer rowboats out of wood. Okay, the next issue is species extinction. Now, here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what a great artist I am. I'm going to draw a picture of a buffalo. I'm going to draw a picture of a cow. I'm going to make the cow a happy cow because the happy cow never went extinct. This is a cow, and he has horns. Isn't he pretty? And here's a buffalo. And I'm going to make the buffalo unhappy since he almost went extinct. Now why is it that the buffalo almost went extinct and the cow never came within a million miles of going extinct? There was another movie, Dances with Wolves, where the white man, you know, killed the buffalo and uh, the Indian had to kill the white man because the white man was not environmentally correct, only the Indians. <laughs> the reason the buffalo almost went extinct, it was never owned. The reason the cow never went extinct is it was private property. Again, the same refrain, you have to own the forests, you have to own the garbage dumps, you have to own the animals, then you can protect them. If they're not owned, you have a thing called the tragedy of the commons. If we own things in common, we tend to use them faster than if we own them individually. If I give you each uh, a bottle of water like this, and unbeknownst to you, I have a little thing in here that shows how fast you sip it, You'll take your time, because if you don't drink it now, you can drink it in five minutes. No one else is going to grab it. We have private property. But if I gave you a big bowl of water with a straw, everyone would slurp it up quickly, <laughs> because somebody else will grab it, so you've got to grab it quicker. 
That's the tragedy of the commons. If you each own a patch of land, you won't let your sheep or your cows eat to the roots of the grass, because then it's harder to get grass. Once they get down to a certain level, you put them in a different field. If the, uh, the pasture is owned in common, you don't care. If you kill a cow, what's the cost to you? The cost to you is you don't have a cow tomorrow. It's a pretty high cost. If you kill a buffalo, what's the cost to you? Nothing, because you wouldn't have the buffalo anyway if it's not owned. So yes, the white man killed the buffalo just to get the tongue, which was a delicacy. He didn't care. He was acting rationally according to the price system. In Africa, the, uh, the elephant, the tusk, Ivory is worth $200 a pound, and the tusks are two, 300 pounds. So the elephant is worth a lot of money. And they're not owned. They just run around like crazy. So poachers come, and they kill them, and they take the tusk, and they leave the animal, and, and you will have a species extinction. And the uh, rhino, now it's worth $100 or $200 an ounce, because the rhino horns is only about 20 pounds, but it's per ounce, and in the Far East, they regard this as very valuable. And they're killing them indiscriminately. If they were privately owned, I now own a herd of elephants. It's not a farmyard. The farmyard is a very big farmyard. These elephants need room to move, and you need a thick fence or an electrifying fence to keep them there. And then they would be like cows. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not a biologist. An elephant is just a big cow. <laughs> with, with, a funny, with a funny trunk. But economically, it's the same thing. If you want to protect them, you own them. And you get a guy there who makes sure that nobody takes his cows or takes his, his elephants. Will I, if I own an elephant herd, allow you to shoot one? Sure. For a nice high price. And the price for a male elephant will not be so high because you don't need that many male elephants. The farmer keeps one bull and 50 cows, not 50 bulls and one cow. <laughs> I have to explain this to you. You're college students. You don't understand how this works. I'm kidding. You want to shoot a pregnant female elephant? Sure. $20 million for a very, very high price. Because the female elephants, especially a female pregnant elephant, is worth a lot of money. So I will act to keep the species alive. Whereas if it's unowned, people will just kill them and they'll be gone. There was another movie, a Star Trek movie. People see Star Trek here. <laughs> what happened was the whales were gone. And now we're in the 23rd century. And the people from the 26th century come back to the 23rd century and they see no whales and they say, uh-oh, we're going to kill you all because we love whales. So our boys, Spock and Kirk, had to come back to our century to get some whales to bring to the 23rd century so that the <clears throat> 26th century <coughs> people would leave them alone. Well, why were there no whales? Why are whales becoming extinct? No private property. My next book, after, well, after a few more that I've got planned, will be well, how we should privatize the oceans and keep those whales where we want them. What is this whale freedom where the whales just run around wherever they want? No, <laughs> we, we have to keep those whales alive. And it's the same with fish. You have overfishing because of the tragedy of the commons. So again, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't, privatize it. Privatize everything, including the roads and the oceans and everything, to protect species. OK, these are the nice, cuddly species. What about the nasty species? Snakes and uh, bugs that bite you. Will we get rid of them? Does anyone want to protect them? Yes, pharmaceutical companies and great universities like Sao Paulo University 
the biology departments want to have these animals to study. And maybe in 50 years, they'll cure some disease that we don't even have now. We didn't have AIDS for a while, and then we got AIDS, and now we're getting rid of AIDS. Well, the next disease, maybe some little bug will cure it. So people, if we can own them privately, will want to preserve them. Not every species, there are so many of them, and we don't even know how many species there are. It's time for another drug break. Okay, I've only got two more subjects to cover and then I will have discussion and dialogue. The next is environmental racism. What's environmental racism? Environmental racism is the idea that black people in the US live in areas that are dirty and uh, and white people or rich people live in areas that are cleaner, and this is unfair. Now, this is a complicated issue because there are two sources of environmental racism. One is legitimate, the other is illegitimate. First, the illegitimate one. I'm going to start a new factory, and I don't have to worry about injunctions or damages because we don't have laws like that. Where am I going to open my factory? In a poor black area or in a rich white area? Obviously in a poor black area because the prices of land will be cheaper there. And I'll take advantage of black people or poor people and the two go together because there's a proportionality. Whites are richer than blacks for reasons we don't have to go into. We're talking about environmentalism. Well, this is improper. This source of environmental racism is no good because you're just exploiting poor people. You're violating their property rights by putting your factory in their area and then you're going to pollute them. And the solution is to uphold private property rights so that nobody can do these things unless they're very careful to keep their smoke to themselves. So that's the bad source of environmental racism. What's the good source of environmental racism? Well, look, you know, we're not against pollution per se. You've got to have some. And we libertarians have this thing called homesteading, the way you get private property is by homesteading it. Well, look, suppose I'm the first one there. I'm the first one in Pittsburgh where they make steel. And I have some pollution, a limited amount. And now you come and you need a oxygen tent because you have a, a lung problem. And you come next door to me. And you say, close down your steel mill. <laughs> well, I was there first. I homesteaded the right to pollute a little bit. Take another case, air, airports. I set up an airport, and the airport is one square mile. I'm there first, before any of you guys. And the noise is uh, 10 square miles. And I'll illustrate with these lines, noise. And now you come and want to build a house right there, and you say, shut down your airport. <laughs> well, I was there first. I homesteaded not only the square mile where the runways are, but also 10 square miles where I made noise. Look, you can't have an airport with absolute quiet. So I was there first. And what you're doing is called coming to the nuisance and then trying to get me to shut down my airport or coming to Pittsburgh and demanding pure air. No. So the second source of environmental racism is legitimate. If I have an airport or a steel mill and I pollute a little bit of uh, dust particles, you can't have a steel mill with pure air, or I'm a, uh, a pig farmer and I pollute a uh, smell, or I'm an airplane uh, uh, airport, and I 
have noise pollution, well, the value of the land will be a little lower than it otherwise would be if I didn't do that. And poor people, when they're trying to figure out where to live, naturally gravitate toward cheaper areas, so they move in there. So it's not really environmental racism, it's just environmental povertyism. Any, it's not a matter of skin color, it's a matter of if you're poor and you can't afford a, a rich area, you move to a poor area, and one of the poor areas is where they have these sorts of things. So that would be the justification. Last topic is global warming. Now, when I look at the global warming, I'm going to make another diagram here, and this is not supply and demand, this is time, and this is temperature. What it looks like to me is a, a thing like this, and here's the present. And if you want to prove global warming, you start here and you say, look, global warming. <laughs> if you want to prove global cooling, you start here and say, look, global cooling. I mean, we have to use this point because that's the present, but should we start here or start there? I don't know. All I know is that the burden of proof is on he who wants to change things and make people not have washing machines and not have underarm deodorants and not have air conditioners. They have to prove something. They never said what the optimal temperature is. <coughs> I love the case where they have environmental conferences and they have to cancel it because it's too cold. <laughs> Sort of like with the birds and the uh, windmills. You have to love that. See, in the 1970s, the alarmists, the left-wing environmentalists, you know what they were complaining about? Global cooling. Then in the 90s, they started complaining about global warming. But then there were too many counterexamples of the global warming where they had to cancel their conferences because it was too cold. So now what they complain about is change. Any change. In other words, the, the, uh, the verdict is clear, guilty for capitalism. The indictment keeps changing. Sometimes capitalism is guilty of too hot, sometimes guilty of too cold, sometimes guilty of any change. We know capitalism is no good. Let me just say one last word. I consider some of these people watermelons. What is a watermelon? Green on the outside, but red on the inside? Why red? Communism. There are certain people that like to run the lives of everyone else. And for a while, they had a pretty good thing with communism. But then East Germany looked, compared to West Germany, North Korea, South Korea, Soviet Union fell apart, and their, their excuses, well, we had the wrong leaders. <laughs> There's just too many cases. So they had to drop socialism as their main support, and, but they need a, a horse to pull their wagon, their wagon of interfering with other people's lives, and they picked environmentalism. And it's no more valid than socialism as a way of running other people's lives. Okay, so that, that's the end of my formal comments. I, to summarize, I've given you six or eight or ten areas where left-wing environmentalists complain about capitalism, and I'm second to none about complaining about crony capitalism and imperialism, but when it comes to laissez-faire free market capitalism, I'm a big fan of it, I defend it, and I try to show that if we have private property, it will solve all environmental problems, Perfectly? No. Nothing is perfect, but it'll solve them. And it'll and the other one won't. So I now call upon questions, objections, uh, comments. Yes, sir. Uh, professor, let's suppose that this, the science behind global warming is true, or something like it, or something like global warming. What would be some possible free market solutions? If global warming were true, and the burden of proof is on those people, well, then it's another form of pollution. And we would have to stop people from using air conditioners or 
coal or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, look, we, we don't want to incinerate ourselves, right? And if, if we were really raising the temperature in such a way that we're all going to die, I mean, capitalism isn't a, a death um, agreement. Capitalism is supposed to, <clears throat> they say fair capitalism is supposed to protect us. And if we're really true, that, that either global warming or that other one, what's it called? Um, ultraviolet rays. Um, ozone layer. The ozone layer disappearing. I, I cover that in my book on this. I didn't mention it here, but let me just mention it briefly. The problem I have with the ozone layer is where is the ozone layer disappearing? Over Antarctica. But there's no business there. So that's a little strange. But suppose that it were true, that the ozone layer were, were uh, disappearing due to, uh, what do you call it? Uh, can CFC. Sorry? CFC. CFC things uh, under on deodorant, air conditioning. Well, we'd have to ban them. Because getting rid of the, the, the cloud that protects us, we'd all get cancer. So I'm, I'm not saying that you know, we should have cancer and die. But the burden of proof is on these people. And these people, they keep coming up with, chick, you know what Chicken Little is? The, the childhood story, uh, the sky is falling, the, child, the sky is falling. There's this guy, Paul Ehrlich, a Malthusian. Saying, no, we have overpopulation. And, and we're going to get its subsistence level. And let me give you the overpopulation business. What, the, what Malthus and Paul Ehrlich, who won some sort of prize for his brilliance, uh, what, what they say is, here is time, and here is wealth, and here is the subsistence level. And whenever population gets above, we have too many people, we have to have wars and famines, and then we get too few people, and now we can increase, so population will be like that, around the subsistence level. This is just economic illiteracy. We know that we're never near the subsistence level in all recorded history. How do we know this? Because we've had slavery all through recorded history. Now, I'm not in favor of slavery. I'm just using it as an economic indication to prove that Paul Ehrlich and the Malthusians are wrong. Suppose we had subsistence level. That means that your slave can't produce any more than is necessary to keep him alive. How much would you pay for a slave like that if you were in the slave-owning business? Nothing. Where's the profit? Who would go through the expense of going to Africa and grabbing a slave? Nobody. Because the slave can't get you anything more than you need to keep him alive. But we've had slavery throughout recorded history, which shows we've never been at the subsistence level. OK, every once in a while there's a storm and people die. But th this is nonsense. So to answer your question, if it were proven somehow, well, then it would be equivalent to violations of property rights or human rights. Yes, sir? Uh, about the, you said that I'm doing the devil's advocate here. Uh, I'm liberal, but uh, I'm picking the, the answers of the, the other people. Uh, you're saying that the, the problem with airports uh, and that thing is like less uh, free market. Uh, I'm just asking you if it's not a, a notion of private property and like in noise or private property in pollution. Like we don't know like who owns that air or or I, which air I own in like uh, around me or that kind of stuff. So we don't we don't know that kind of knowledge or like we didn't decide yet. So that problem like can make a lot of people. Well, the way I interpret this, did everyone hear what he said? My interpretation was, <clears throat> how do you tell who owns which air? Notice I never said anyone owns any air, and if I did, I had a slip of the tongue, I made a mistake. You can't own air because air is not scarce. At our conference, we talked about intellectual property not being scarce. Well, if it's not scarce, you can't own it. The whole, I'll, I'll get to you next. The whole point of owning stuff is it has to be scarce. Like, if I'm wearing this jacket, you can't wear the jacket, and if you're wearing it, I can't wear it. 
And we have to have a theory as to who has a right to own it or to wear it. Otherwise, we'll be at each other's throats all the time. So property rights are just a way of saying who owns what. But if it's not scarce, then we can all use it. Now, air on the moon is scarce. Air on Mars in the spaceship is scarce, and now you have to buy and sell air. Air in the hospital, pure oxygen. But ordinary air, look, when you run a marathon, at the end of the marathon, you're going like this, <laughs> trying to catch your breath. Nobody comes up to you and says, you're hogging up all the air, <laughs> because we have plenty. No, what I mentioned was sending over dust particles through the air onto other people. Very different concept. Yes, sir. No, I was going to say that uh, clean air and clean water are in fact scarce. So I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Clean air and clean water are scarce. So how do we deal? Well, I would say privatize it. Look, this water over here, very clean. Uh -huh. uh, if we had private reservoirs competing with each other, I mean, competition gets us a better product. The reason we have pretty good jackets is if somebody makes a bad jacket that falls apart, nobody will buy his jacket and he'll go broke. Air is no different than milk or Coca-Cola or orange juice. It's just a liquid. And all liquid should be owned, and they should sell it to us. And they might say, well, I'm getting it for free right now. No, you're not getting it for free right now. You're paying taxes for it. And the taxes cost more than what the price would be because we have competition, which leads to more efficiency. Uh, water is different than air. You see, uh, when air, you're making what I would regard as the same mistake. See, because air is not scarce. It's plentiful. Just like an idea, the Pythagorean theorem, or E equals MC squared. Once it's out there, it's not scarce. Anyone can use it. Air here, See, well, when you look at it in clean air, I don't like to look at it that way. What I like to say is the air is free, the air is scarce, you can't own the air, unless you're on Mars or the moon. But you've got to keep your dust particles to yourself. So it's a different issue. Now, with regard to water, Canada, where I spend half a year, is up to its armpits in water. I mean, they've got water. I think Brazil's got plenty of fresh water also. And in the US, in the desert, in California and Nevada, they're very parched. They need water. And the Canadian view is never one drop shall go to the Americans, because it's pure Canadian water. In Yiddish, it's called mishigas, craziness. Uh, this refusal to trade. Why can't you trade water for something the US creates? Or why can't Brazil sell their water to some place in South America or Africa where they need water and you know, you get other things? There's nothing magical about water. It's just another resource. And yet the way governments look at water is, oh, yeah, it's holy or something. And it's the same thing like with body parts. You know, kidneys, lungs, livers, things like that. It's okay to give them away, but God forbid you charge for it. And as a, re <laughs> and as a result, a lot of people die because they can't get them. And you have people going to the grave with perfectly good body parts. I shouldn't point to myself. My body parts are pretty old. But you people, you have good body parts. You know what they call motorcycles? Donor mobiles. Because if you die in a motorcycle, you're probably 22 and you have good body parts. And you can't sell them. You can only give them away. Well, if it's not illicit to do something, why should it be illicit to do something for money? If sex is okay, why can't you charge for it. Now look, I wouldn't want my daughter to be a prostitute. <laughs> but if she were, I wouldn't want her to go to jail for it. Because it's not a crime. It's a victimless crime between consenting adults. Back to environmentalism. I get off the topic sometimes. But I'm, I'm willing to consider any question on anything pertaining to libertarianism. It doesn't have to be environmentalism, although that's what I spent most of my time on. Yes, sir?
the extinction of the resource before it can be privatized? Well, I'm not sure I understand fully, but I'll try to answer. And if I don't do it to your satisfaction, try me again. Because I, I'm, I'm not exactly clear, but let me try. What you're saying is that it'll, if there's an imbalance between forests and farms, it'll take time to make it right. Yeah, like maybe today, if many people think that farms would generate more profit, so if there would be less forest. And if we realize it's necessary more forest, uh, maybe we, like the, the damage is done. Well, what you're really saying is one, it takes too much time, and the other, you can make a mistake. And I agree, well, I don't agree that it takes too much time. You know, here's another joke. One economist asks the other, how's your wife? And the other one says, compare to what? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it takes time, but compare to what? Compare to the goddamn government? which has to have hearings for 22 years about anything, you know, paper clips, we have to have a hearing and we have to have an election. Yeah, it takes time, people are imperfect. But the fastest ones that do it make the most profits and therefore in the next uh, iteration or the next time period have more control over more resources because they just make profit and the people who take too long to adjust uh, make losses and, and therefore don't pollute us with their entrepreneurial decision making. In other words, the market is a weeding out process for ineptitude. So yes, it takes time. But, and if you make a mistake, then you lose money. Look, suppose the government makes a mistake. They don't lose money. I'm from New Orleans and um, time for a drug break. I, I need cough drops because my throat is a little sore. Not marijuana, it's just... <laughs> uh, I live in New Orleans and we had Katrina. And 1,900 people died. And in my view, the fault was the Army Corps of Engineers that allowed the, the levees to be broached. And FEMA, the government agency that was supposed to protect us, but kept people away from helping us. Now this is a tragedy, 1,900 people died, but what really bothers an economist is that they're still in business. Can you imagine if a private company made a mistake? They would be gone. Maybe not perfectly, but the more mistakes you make, the less money you have, the less money you have, the less decision making you'll make. British Petroleum. British Petroleum, when they lose money, or Exxon Valdez, oil spills. Anybody that makes a big mistake loses money in the market, and this discourages it. People don't try to make mistakes. Whereas in, the, in Alaska, they built this bridge to nowhere. Uh, in Alaska, they got a lot of money for some senator, and they made a bridge for three people. Did they lose money? No. The, the, you have to compare it to the political system. And the market is imperfect. It's composed of human beings like us. How could it be perfect? But the political system has also got human beings. Well, I don't know if I should make that concession. <laughs> the political system has also got human beings, but we only vote for them every four years. Whereas in the market, we vote every day, the dollar vote. In the political system, if you like Obama's policies 1, 3, 5, and 7, and you like Ron Paul, who will probably be his opponent, <laughs> policies 2, 4, 6, and 8, you have to make a package deal. You just can't say, well, I, uh, I like one over here and three over there. No, you take all of Obama or all of Ron Paul. Whereas in the market, you can vote for a purple jacket or a, a blue shirt or whatever you want. And when you buy a blue shirt, you don't have to buy a, a bicycle too. Imagine in the market, if you, every time you bought a blue shirt, you had to have a bicycle. <laughs> And every time you bought a motorcycle, they made you take a violin. What kind of a business is that? So to answer your question, I think, you're right. It takes time and people make errors. But in the market, we have this fail-safe mechanism to correct as best we can errors. And, and we reward people who do it quickly. 
Because the first one to switch makes the profits first. Question, objection? Professor. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about river privatization. If I have a farm and the river starts in my farm and I put chemistry in, the, in, my, in, in my place and goes to the other farm which the river steals, best. Well, how, how can we deal with that? The, the question was, I'm not sure everyone heard, so let me repeat it to see if I got your point. Suppose we had private rivers, and there's some farm at the top of the river, the top, say, the Mississippi River or the Amazon River, and he puts poison in the river. Already Some I'm chemical, let's say poison, the worst case scenario, puts poison, and it, um, ruins the river, it kills all the fish, and then it gets onto some farm 50 miles downstream, and it kills his crops. Well, if I owned the river, I would make sure that you didn't do that, because it's very akin to pollution. Only instead of through the air, it's through the water. And I can maybe charge money for clean water. You can swim in it, you can fish in it, should any rivers or any lakes be used for pollution dumps? Yeah, maybe in some rivers they should use it for pollution. I mean, we have to put pollution somewhere. We have garbage dumps, nothing wrong with poison. That's going to sound badly when people repeat and say, well, I went to this uh, uh, free market environmentalist and he said poison is okay. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with poison. We have to have poison. It's the result of uh, curing uh, leather or making steel or something. I don't know. We have to put the poison somewhere. Maybe not always in the land, maybe in the water, although the problem with the water is it moves faster than land. So probably we wouldn't, but we have to put it somewhere. Um, so what I would say is that the owner can make profits by stopping that. Probably, because what he has to do is weigh, you know, take the question, you own a lake, should you allow speedboats or swimmers? There's nothing holy about speedboats, nothing holy about swimmers. What you do is you say, well, how much will the speedboat people give me? How much will the swimmers give me? Maybe I can have speedboats in the middle of the lake and swimmers at the side of the lake. In other words, what you're trying to do is maximize revenues. And the way to maximize revenues is by satisfying consumers. So the answer is not clear that you should stop all poison. Conceivably, you could make more money by storing poison in your river or your lake. Unlikely. Probably, you would just stop that. But, I mean, who owns the river? If it's, a, a, it's different farms during the course of the river? Uh, the question is, who should own the river? And the libertarian answer is whoever homesteaded it, whoever used it. Now, maybe it's the people who had the boats or the people who swam in it. If we had a God's eye view, God knows everything, looks down and says, aha, now I know who used the river. Or the, or the lake, who should own Paulista Avenue? Paul, that's the avenue for Ron Paul fans. <laughs> Paulista Avenue, who should own Paulista Avenue? <laughs> well, maybe uh, the people whose taxes went into it. It'd be very hard to figure that out. Look, they had the same problem in the Soviet Union. When they, when they privatized in 1991, they had steel mills, they had farms, factories, all owned by the government. They had to turn it over to private enterprise somehow. It's, it's sort of like unscrambling the egg. You know, once you make scrambled eggs, it's hard to get them back into the shell. Very difficult, but this is not the problem of private enterprise. This is the problem of socialism. And we're trying to fix it with private enterprise, and we can only do it imperfectly. Whoever's using it, the people who use Paulista Avenue, uh, the, the taxi cab companies, the motorcycle people, maybe the people who have buildings on each side of it. And what you do is you make uh, a million shares, and you give one share to each of them, and now you have the Paulista Avenue uh, Corporation listed on the stock exchange owned by all these million people, one share each, and now you can buy and sell shares. Well, you can do it for the river, too. Uh, you people ask questions. Okay. Just, okay. Uh, I think that he asked, 
Yes. And I uh, poisoned my part of the river, but it will, the, the next Se next section. The next section will be also I mean, how do we do? Because I'm doing we are my both, private we are both section, using our but property. you are interfering in the other ones. So yes. If, if that's then it's just like you're polluting. You're trespassing. You're poison on someone else's property. And this would be illegal. We would get damages from you and an injunction. And if you did it again, we'd throw you in jail. I mean, if it's an accident, you know, the, the law is different for an accident. There are accidents. But, you know, if you're purposely putting poison in the water and it's infecting his water, you've got to stop you. It's, it's sort of like saying, well, what about murder and rape? Well, this is sort of <clears throat> murder and rape or theft. What do you do with murder, rape, and theft in a civilized order? You put them in jail. You make sure they don't do it. Can we stop it perfectly? No, there's always going to be murder, always going to be rape, but you try to get the bad guys to stop. Yes, sir? Yeah, it's a problem that uh, we said that uh, for libertarians, the, you, you own it when you have your home study, right? And, and I'm asking you if you ever read the, I don't know if the name in English is that, but the letter of the earth, it's a document made in 2000, I guess. It's like the new human rights with the nature, something like that, I would like to know. If you read it, and uh, because it's exceptionally different from the libertarian principles in some aspects. Say it in Portuguese, and maybe someone can translate. Carta da Terra. Yes, the letter of the word. Letter of the word. Dirt. Yes. Dirt. 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 Letter of the what? Dirt. 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 Letter of the earth. It, it sounds like this Gaia, G A I. Something like that, uh, where they say, I haven't read that, but I know the guy on hypothesis. The guy on hypothesis is that we don't own the earth, the earth owns us. This is crazy. Inanimate things like earth can't own us. It's like saying that this pen owns me. I mean, that, that's just preposterous. And then they say when you take a plow and you uh, cut the mother earth, it's like rape or uh, stabbing the earth. This is just poetry. I mean, the libertarian theory is for human beings. I'm a humanist. They say it's sort of like a racist or a sexist. I'm a humanist. I love human beings. The earth is only instrumental. Look, one day, uh, the earth will disappear because the sun will go out in about a trillion years. And I'm humanist enough to hope that by that time our great-grandchildren will have enough spaceships not only to go to Pluto, but to go to another solar system. The hell with the Earth. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, because this can be taken out of context. But I mean, the Earth is only for us. We're not for the Earth. You get these Indian, native Indians who say the Earth owns us. What does it mean? Does it mean if I walk on the Earth, the Earth has a right to smack me? <laughs> I mean, if I walk on you, you have a right to smack me. Unless we're consenting sadomasochists or something like that. But, uh, the Earth can't own us. Now, I haven't read that particular piece, but I'm very familiar with the guy on hypothesis. And if I were adding more points to my list of 10 or 12, I might have added that too. But I regard that as so silly, not really worthy of consideration. I mean, what does it mean that the Earth owns us? Well, if the Earth owns us, it has a right to boss us around. But the Earth can't speak. So I, I think it's just silly. I don't think it's a serious thing. Yes, sir, I'm not sure. Do you have your hand up? No. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Go ahead. Uh, I'll pick on you next time. Go ahead. I don't know if the, the, the question will be in the text, but you talk about you privatize the roads and oceans, and I, th I talk about the question of traffic. 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 Uh, uh, car, very much cars. Congestion. Cities, congestion. It's a problem of location, too. Well, 
uh, I have a whole book on this, and I have a whole two-hour lecture on this, which I didn't give, but since I said you can ask about anything, I can talk about this a little bit, but my main focus is environmentalism. In uh, congestion, there is this thing called peak load pricing. And I don't know what it's like in Sao Paulo, but, and I've been riding around here, and there seems to be congestion at all hours, you know, at <laughs> six in the morning, three in the morning, whatever. But the ordinary way, here is time, and here is traffic. And the ordinary way of looking at traffic congestion is like this. You go here at six in the morning, nine, noon, three, six, nine, midnight. And at six, there's not much traffic. And at nine, there's a lot of traffic. And then at noon, there's a little less. And then at three, a little less. And then at over here, and it goes like that. Something like this, the traffic pattern during the day. Uh, even in Sao Paulo, I'm sure at um, 3 in the morning, I haven't been out then, there's much less traffic than at uh, nine, eight, 8 in the morning or 5 at night or 6 at night. So what peak load pricing is, is you charge more for the peaks and you push down the peaks and you charge less for the troughs or for the less use and you increase it. So instead of having like this, what you have is the oscillations are a little less. For example, in uh, the ski, skiing uh, areas, in the winter they charge much more than in the summer. They charge a little in the summer, but much more during the peak load uh, skiing is in the winter. So they try to even it out and private road owners would do this. What the government does is it engages in anti-peak load pricing. Namely, it exacerbates the oscillations. It makes it even worse. Now, I know somebody said here that if you have a certain license plate that ends in a one, you can only drive on Tuesday, Wednesday, or something like that. I forget the exact system. This is an attempt. In the US, what they do is they urge you to carpool, and they urge companies to, uh, some start at 7 in the morning, some start at 8, some start at 9, some start at 10, 10 to 7, and, uh, you know, uh, vary it. That's socialist nonsense. <laughs> what you have to do is the prices. If we, and what they do is they do anti-load, peak load pricing, is what they do in the U.S. is they give you a, uh, like for the bridges or the tunnels, they give you a pass. Uh, for a certain amount of month, you can go through w without putting money in, in the turnstile, but you have a little electronic thing and you go slowly, you can go right through with nobody collects any money. Do they charge more or less per trip to the people who use it every day? Less. And the people who use it every day are much more likely to use it to go to work and to come back from work. So what they're doing is charging these people less when they should be charging them more to get to iron out the oscillations. So here again, the government is a disgrace. If a private company did that, imagine a ski, a, a ski place that charged less in the, uh, uh, in the winter. They'd go broke because the other ski lodges would charge more and make more profit. But here you have the private uh, companies doing that. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know enough about the situation, but my suspicion is that they're under the government rule, that the government tells them what to do. Because any private company worthy of the name private company, as opposed to fascist company working with the government, would not do that. Yeah, they have some quasi-private government cooperation, which is called fascism. But I'm talking about pure private enterprise where the government has got nothing to do with this. Yes, sir? Uh, you were saying about the, the human issue and the earth and this kind of thing, like of Gaia and this kind of stuff. And so what I own, I can do whatever I want. It's kind of it. Like if I own an uh, animal, 
uh, now, like if I want to eat or something, I can I can kill it. But if uh, if I put into into suffering, I, I have the right or not? Uh, I want to know if your opinion about that. Uh, the issue is animal cruelty, yes. torturing animals. I regard this as a sort of a weakness of libertarianism, because I think this is despicable to torture an animal. I mean, killing an animal cleanly with no suffering, I'm, I'm not a vegetarian. I think we have a right to eat cows and pigs. But to torture animals has got to be one of the most despicable things, a helpless dog or a cat and you burn it, or you know, it's just horrible. And I wish I could think of a way for libertarianism to put these guys in jail or to give them a death penalty or do to them what they're doing to the animals, show them how it feels to be burned alive. That would seem to be justice. Unfortunately, libertarianism is just between human beings. It's, it's not between human beings and animals. Uh, and therefore, uh, I see a little bit of a weakness in libertarianism. I wish I could think of a way. Now, the only thing I thought of is that if you see somebody doing this, what you want to do is punch him in the nose. And then when he sues you for assault and battery, which he has a right to do, we all give you a medal, and we give a, a little parade in your honor, and you go to jail. Look, the example I used is, can a libertarian be a concentration camp guard for the Nazis? And here's the situation. Every concentration camp, jar, uh, concentration camp guard kills 100 innocent people a day. Jews, blacks, gypsies, gays. You kill 100 people a day. But you can, you're a libertarian. You can go to the Nazi concentration camp place, and you can only kill 90 people. And you'll save 10 people every day, should you do it. Well, according to libertarian punishment theory, if you murder 90 people a day, <laughs> you're a murderer. And when we have the Nuremberg trials at the end of the Nazi period, we put you in the dock. And now you say, look, I'm a murderer, but my motivation was not to kill people. My motivation was to save people. And save <coughs> and I save 10 people a day. And now it's a year later, and I say 3,600 people. But I'm a murderer. If the heir of any of the people that I killed wants me to die, I'll go. First, I've got to get a medal on. Because I'm a hero. I saved 3,600 people. You've got to give me a medal. And then you can execute me. If any one of the heirs of the people who I killed says that we want to impose the death penalty on you, which would be the justification for libertarians. But my hope would be that they would all say, well, look, Block is a very strange kind of concentration camp guard. He's not the ordinary one. He's one who saved 3,600 people. It's too bad that my child or my spouse wasn't one of the ones he saved. And all those 3,600 people are going to come to the court and say, yes, Block saved my life. Without Block, I would be dead also. So my answer to the torture of animals is, go and punch him in the nose. Kick him in the crotch. They deserve it. And then pay the penalty. That's the only thing I can think of. It's a stretch. But I'm trying to be true to libertarian theory, and I'm trying to be nice to animals. Because it's, decent, it's indecent to torture animals. It's disgusting. It's despicable. It's, it's horrible. And yet, libertarianism is just between human beings. So we have no way. I mean, if you can kill an animal, uh, if you're justified in killing it, I mean, I can't, it's hard to see how we can make a rule while you can't torture it. So that, that's my best answer. And I'm hoping when I publish stuff like this, and when I speak about it, that other people will come up with a better uh, solution than mine so that I can learn. Because I don't know all the libertarian answers. I'm just struggling to apply libertarian principles to all sorts of weird examples, not just environmental, but anything. I apply libertarian theory to everything. Yes, sir? Couldn't the 
this problem be solved by the Profit Law Society uh, with kind of fines or could be ex expelled for a condominium or? Yes, well, we could use the boycott, not fines, because a fine is theft. I mean, a fine. With, pro with uh, previous accepted uh, agreed contracts. Yes, if you had a condominium association or the golf club or the tennis club, and they have a rule that anyone who tortures animals can't be in our club. And if you sign that, then we can get you. But the problem with boycotts, from an economic point of view, every time you boycott someone, you make them stronger. Because if we boycott South Africa, which we used to boycott, their prices go down. And then it becomes tempting for other people to break the boycott. So yes, we can obviously boycott these people. These people are miserable excuses for human beings, and we should have nothing to do with them. But I want to do more to them than just boycott them. But you're quite right. I should have said that at least we can boycott them. The civilized people should have nothing to do with them. And if they lie about it, then they're committing fraud. But if they go into the backwoods and they torture animals and we don't know about it, or if we do know about it, and they're independent, they're self-sufficient, there's not much we can do. They're not in our condominium golf club. So we can't boycott them. Certainly we should boycott them. Yes, sir? Could you talk a little bit about consumption, overconsumption? Overconsumption? Yes, like unnecess unnecessary consumption. Unnecessary consumption. I was once at a conference when Jean Fonda was getting married. Jean Fonda is an actress, a beautiful actress, uh, movies, very rich. She had 12 wedding dresses. Now, a wedding dress, I understand, is very expensive. I'm not into cross-dressing, so I don't know that much. <laughs> I don't know uh, personal experience, but my understanding is a wedding dress is $5,000, some crazy amount. She had 12 of them. Why 12? Who knows? She wanted to try this one, that one. I don't know. And I was at a Liberty Fund conference with a whole bunch of free enterprises. And they were all saying, well, this is conspicuous consumption. This is no good. This is bad. And I turned to them and I said, well, how many books do you guys have? This is in the days before uh, electronic <laughs> books. And most professors, I must have 5,000 books. And they all had books. I play handball, and to play handball, you have to have gloves. I must have 30 pair of gloves. Imelda Marcos had 5,000 pair of high heel shoes. Who am I to say that you shouldn't spend your money the way you want, if you earned it? Jane Fonda earned it. She did workout tapes. She did movies. She did songs. I don't know what she did. She earned the money. Why can't she spend it on, in a way that I wouldn't? I'm not going to buy 12 wedding dresses. Even if I were a transvestite, I wouldn't be. <laughs> Maybe six. <laughs> I'm a moderate. That's why they call me Walter Moderate Block. <laughs> but I, I think that it's wrong for some. Look, if you don't like it, boycott them. Anyone can boycott anyone for anything. But the question is should it be against the libertarian law? And the libertarian law says the only time we can use violence against you is if you use or threaten violence first. Buying wedding dresses or books or, uh, I don't know, whatever, handball gloves is not per se a rights violation. So my answer would be anyone can have as many wedding dresses or use their money frivolously. My favorite character is Scrooge McDuck from Donald Duck. And what Scrooge McDuck would have is a money bin and he would pour the money up and then triple down on him. Not my thing, but you know, if Scrooge McDuck enjoys it, let him enjoy it. If he earned the money honestly, and if he didn't earn it honestly, we should take the money away from him. You have got four or five chances, so let me get other people on, and if no other people, I'll come back to you. Anyone else who hasn't had any question? I'm an egalitarian here. <laughs> Anyone who hasn't asked a question at all? Okay, your turn. Okay, in the case of a factory that emits particles, it's relatively easy to know if a neighborhood is being polluted by a certain factory. But in the case of, let's say, greenhouse gases, you cannot know which, you, you cannot point to a specific damage that a certain factory has caused in the case of greenhouse. So would a libertarian defend something like 
uh, carbon emission quotas or taxes? I don't know. Well, you see, here's where environmental forensics comes in. Remember what forensics is? Is the study of uh, semen or blood or hair follicles or stuff under your fingernails. And in the 1830s, they were doing this. Very low uh, technology. But nowadays, if we had the law the right way, surely uh, environmental forensics would be able to tell uh, if you're emitting stuff that's invisible to the naked eye, but the chemical chemists could figure it out who's doing what. They would just maybe go near a smokestack and, and study what's happening there. Look, you know, I just read that uh, snipers can now kill people with a rifle a half a mile away. Yeah, but, but the thing is, sure. connecting that with a certain damage, let's say, and water levels raised in the Philippines and people died, how, how do you know which factory to blame? Supposing well, the science is true. Well, if you can't tell, and I'm willing to posit anything, my first answer is we could tell if we spent resources in this sort of forensics. If we couldn't tell, stipulate, just for argument's sake, and yet there were people dying here from whatever, then we would have to seriously consider that because people dying over here, the burden of proof would be that they're dying because of this, but it's less so we could establish that. See, then there's another problem. Suppose we have 100,000 polluters. Each polluter pollutes uh, an in, a very small amount. And if he were the only polluter, it would be de minimis. But now we have 10,000 of them, and all together, they, uh, they do serious damage. Well, we get them all. Uh, we have to protect people and, and property. But I, I don't like that assumption that we can't tell. It, it, it goes against history. Because even in the 1830s, they were already trying this. Nowadays, with modern technology, but again, I'm willing to stipulate anything. And you know, just for argument's sake, we say we can't tell. Well, we can't tell, but we know that all 10,000 of them did it. Get them all to stop, or get them all to cut it back, or, or something. But we can't just say, oh well, uh, throw up our hands and say, well, we can't do anything. And people are dying here. And we can demonstrate that all 10,000 of them did it. We gotta stop them. So th this is not a, a recipe for mass murder. <coughs> this is an attempt to save people and save property by using private property rights. Whereas the left-wing environmentalists, they hear capitalism and they say, ah, run roughshod over people. Well, that's crony capitalism, that's fascism, but that's not libertarianism, that's not laissez-faire capitalism. You have to make a distinction between the very two different kinds of capitalism. And as I say, a lot of people in Latin and South America, they hear this and they say, well, we must be Marxists. Or we, or we now embrace Marxism because if that's the alternative, then Marxism will choose Marxism. But that's not the alternative. The, the alternative is not capitalism or Marxism. There are three alternatives, crony capitalism or fascism, then there's laissez-faire capitalism, which is very different, and then there's Marxism. Yes, sir. Oh, somebody else? How about this young girl here? <laughs> yes. What, what are your comments on the Rio Plus 20 event that is happening now in Rio de Janeiro? What's happening now in Rio de Janeiro? The Rio Plus 20 is a conference on the environment. There was a, a Eco 92 in Rio, in Nacho, and now, 20 years later, there is an event in well, I, I don't know anything about it, but I'll tell you one thing, that there's no free market environment at that conference. <laughs> because this is too silly, this is uh, crazy, uh, we, can't, uh, uh, we, we can't contemplate this. I mean, if they were serious, they would have someone, it doesn't have to be me, there are other people that are free market environmentalists, but there would be somebody who would take a, a slightly different view. But they're sure of it. They're not interested in, in a, a serious conference. They're only interested in promoting their Gaia hypothesis. And I say this not knowing anything about them, but knowing other left-wing environmentalists, 
You know, in my school, Loyola University, I teach environmental economics. And in every other department, they teach environmentalism. Uh, they teach it in biology, they teach it in English literature, they teach it in philosophy, the philosophy of the environment, many, many courses in environment. And they all cross-list each other, namely, each one mentions all the others. So I went to them and I said, cross-list me. I teach environmental economics, and I'll cross-list you. And they put me through the ringer. Well, what's your syllabus? Do you give the other side? And I do. I have Al Gore's book, which is a left-wing book, and I have a, a, a good book. <laughs> and I have a lot of readings. And they said, oh, Al Gore is no good. We have to, this is no good. So I turned to them and I said, well, how do you balance your syllabus? And you know what their answer was? They never replied. <laughs> Just like this conference. They have the truth with a capital T, and anyone who disagrees with them, they don't want to hear from, they don't want to have a debate, they don't want to consider this alternative. Look, how many people are here? 30, 35 people? Yet this school, how many students are in this school? 30,000? 30, 30,000 <coughs> 30, in the University of Sao Paulo? No, no, no. The whole university, how many? 52,000. 52, I'll bet you 51,000 are all left-wing environmentalists. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe that's an underestimate. And only 35 or 40 people come here and are willing to listen. The professors who teach this stuff don't say, well, give the, the other side a chance, go listen. If anything, they say, don't come here. Right? But it, it's not just this school. I don't want to pick on the University of Sao Paulo. My university is the same thing. These people are watermelons. They're green on the outside. They're red on the inside. They want to promote their socialist views. And socialism doesn't work, so they promote environmentalism of the craziest sort. They don't appreciate private property rights or the price system or the economics. Now, these arguments that I gave, I covered maybe 10 or 15 issues. They're not the last word. There's more work to be done on all of them, but I've given you a, a sort of a ballpark figure over. If you want, let me give you my email address. Um, w Lock at L O Y N O dot E D U. Email me. And I will give you more bibliography. I will answer questions that you didn't think of. Some of you didn't ask any questions. Maybe you'll think of a question. I'll answer it. Let's get a dialogue going. W Block. W B L O C K at L O Y N O L O Y N O Lewis Oliver Yellow New Orleans E D U for education. Write it down. This will be on the quiz. <laughs> uh, email me. Maybe the next time I'm in Sao Paulo and we have another discussion, we'll have 3,000 people in the audience. Thanks to you people. If you're interested in exploring an, an alternative view. But I think we're running out of questions and I'm running out of cough drops. <laughs> so thanks for your attention.